All right, everyone, time for the next installment of just midterm banter. Now, of course, we're still in the middle of July, so we've got quite a while to go until midterm voting, and anything can happen uh, until then. Uh, for instance, in August, we'll need to watch the Senate polling more closely because, remember, Mitch McConnell suspended their August recess. That affects six Democrats that are vulnerable and only one Republican. And trust me, the Republican Party will sweeten the deal for her. They're going to throw money into that race and they hand over fist to keep her safe. And be like, just cooperate. We can knock two or three Democrats out with this strategy. Don't worry. Uh, so it's time to look at some numbers. First and foremost, though, we got to talk about an NPR article. Uh, where they were openly speculating, hey, you know, Trump could drive up turnout for Republicans, laying waste any chance of a blue wave. And that's that's really been part of my predictions. When I say Trump needs 45% approval, you'd think, well, that's below 50%. It's not great. Yeah, number one, that's not technically true. Um, there are people who, who softly disapprove. He's got a larger core fan base, I think, than most people. And he's being bombarded on a daily basis by the entire corporate media and yet, oh, you know, 43% of Americans, I guess, approve of the job he's doing, and more than half on the economy, at least. Uh, that's not a bad position to be in, all things considered. But here's the thing. I believe that the traditional will hold true, uh, and that turnout among GOPers, especially in, in disproportionately red areas, will be high. Now, here's the thing. For the Senate especially, that's most of the Democrats that are vulnerable anyway. They're vulnerable because they're in Trump territory. And with the SCOTUS decision coming up, literally tomorrow Trump's going to announce his choice. I hope it's Amy Barrett, but it may not be. Orrin Hatch referred to the uh, uh, upcoming nomination in the female tense. So he may be an insider. He may know that it is Amy Barrett. I'm hoping that that's true because it'll throw a wrench in the Democrats' plans. Because then it'll make it doubly difficult for those vulnerable Democrats in red areas to vote against the nominee. They, 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 I mean, they'll piss off their own fans, potentially, by not voting for another female justice. They potentially piss off Republicans that voted for them to be in office because they're moderates. And it's like, yeah, but you're a red state Democrat, so you're not a Pelosi. It's okay. They could end up all getting wiped off the face of the earth. You could end up with, with a net gain of six seats in the Senate for the Republicans. It's possible. It's not likely, but it's possible. I think three would be a reasonable number in McCaskill. I think getting knocked off would be sort of the gem in the crown of the Republicans in the midterms. Uh, but here's the thing. Trump is still wildly popular in a lot of the places where these people have to run. Therefore, Trump can go and campaign, uh, and it'd be a good idea. These people will invoke Trump while they're campaigning. The, the Republicans, that is. That'd be a good idea. And it means that a slim proportion of the Senate can't play hardball with Trump until the midterms are over. Well, that really paves the way for a SCOTUS nominee especially. And that may raise his approval. Look, if he, if he chooses and the person goes through, whoever it is, it will probably raise the approval of the Republican Party, especially on the generic ballot. you got to understand, we got to look at that number too. Right now, the Democrats are about seven points ahead still. It's more or less seems to have stabilized for the last week. I see early indicators based on the Economist poll that it's begun moving slightly in the other direction, that the Republicans are gaining again. I doubt that there will ever be a point at which they're ahead in the generic ballot. It could happen, I just don't think so. I think that the reason why they prevail anyway, despite being technically behind, is turnout. What are the Democrats excited about? The far left is excited about, we will impeach Donald Trump. That's a slim proportion of the Democrats. The centrists, what do they have to be excited about? The Democrats haven't done anything. They've been completely defanged. They can't even run their own party. You have a schismatic tendency within the Democrats. It's increasingly, I think, demoralizing them, especially after the SCOTUS nominee gets put into place. Like, well, Trump's gotten two Supreme Court nominees. He got tax relief. The economy's up. He's taken the wind out of the sails of a large proportion of Democrats. Doesn't look good for them. As far as his approval goes, it's still at around 43%. This is roughly where I expected it to be. Uh, it was at 44, it declined slightly, probably due to immigration, although that may have harmed the Democrats too. Uh, and, and all things considered, that's a decent amount of approval, You know, again, considering the amount of flack that he takes from the fake news media on a daily basis, literally. Because he's gotten them addicted to, be, to Trump derangement, they're exhausting themselves. They have to keep getting more and more sensationalistic, by the way, to provoke the same response in their readers. It's a death spiral. 
eventually some of these groups are going to swing wildly away from the rest and throw up their hands and admit defeat. And then at that point, Trump's approval will probably surge. This will happen before 2020, not before the midterms, I don't expect. Uh, you already see early warning signs of that happening. The Democrats should be terrified. But here's the thing. Overall, I still give a 90% chance that the Republicans retain the Senate. They're probably a 99% chance of that at, at the moment with the trajectory the way it is. I'd give a better than 80% chance they gain in the Senate. That is not just, you know, they continue to lead it by a seat, but they gain a seat or two. I'd say two or three is, is a good, you know, total. Uh, I give about 70% chance that the Republicans maintain the House. A lesser chance, the House map is not as demographically pleasing to the Republicans as the Senate map. Senate map, it's like, well, we're only defending one for three seats. The House is like it's more even. Um, a lot of those races are not in areas that Trump is considered favorable in. But here's the thing. That number may change. Because if Trump's approval hits the magic 45, which is what I've, I've speculated, or even goes higher than that, I think it doesn't matter. Because he'll, he'll be popular enough for that not to be a major issue in those maybe swing regions where there are House seats up. Uh, but again, pretty soon we'll have to start paying attention to individual polling. Right now it's about the generic ballot, uh, just a very broad overview that doesn't take into consideration state for state races. Now it's just looking at them in a general sense. Trump's approval plays into that number and on its own matters. And then we've got to look at any indicators that turnout might be different. Now when you've got a group like NPR speculating that it's possible, you've got to assume that the likelihood is fairly good. Because NPR is a left-leading outlet. They claim to be independent, but it's fairly clear that they're not. They take pu public funding. They get it from Democrats primarily voting for it. Republicans typically oppose the idea. It's pretty self-explanatory what direction they're going to lean in. So when NPR comes out with a story, green lights a story saying, yeah, uh, you know, there might be no blue wave, specifically because Trump's fans are energized still, of course. That's about a third of the voting public. You've got to understand, most Republicans are enthusiastic about Trump. He is the most popular Republican president since Ronald Reagan. He has advantages that Bush certainly didn't have. He has advantages that Herbert Walker absolutely didn't have. He has advantages that a, a challenge like a McCain or a Romney uh, certainly could never hope for. That's why some of these people are angry at him, because he's popular among the party loyal. Uh, as far as those partisans go, those are who you need to energize, like independent voters. If they're independent, they're like, you know, I'm apolitical, I haven't made up my mind yet. They're obviously not going to become magically enthusiastic, barring some miracle happening. So that's basically off the table. It's the core fans that you have to energize. Trump's core fan base is simply larger than that of the generic Democratic Party at large. 80% of those Democrats right now aren't enthusiastic. They might hate Trump. But if they're not enthusiastic about the alternative, which is, hey, more Democrats, what's the point? Many more, of the, many more Republicans, I think, will be voting to stop the Democrats from accomplishing that than Democrats voting to cause it to happen. That's just a theory I happen to have. Now, imagine that's a three-point differential in turnout. That, basically, that makes up half of the generic ballot deficit, and that puts several of those competitive races in the GOP's hands. It keep, certainly lets them keep the Senate, almost certainly gives them a couple Senate seats in addition, probably allows them to maintain the House. That's just from like a three-point difference, maybe four points. It's not off the table, that uh, differential in turnout. I think the Democrats had like, what, five or six extra points of turnout against Romney? And that was, by the way, that was when Obama had lost a lot of his initial popularity. With McCain, it was even larger, wasn't it? Like 10 points or some insane number. And that's, by the way, why a lot of those polls failed in 2016, because they were using that old metric. They were using the metrics from 2012 and in some cases 2008, and they were saying, well, the Democrats will simply come out at higher numbers because they did years ago. Because even though it's not Obama running, and even though Trump's totally different, and the Republican platform's totally different, and the millennial voting block is now almost a decade older, despite all that, our best guess is things remain the same. Republican turnout was higher, though, in 2016. It shot way up because the party's cores uh, were more energized, which is, again, it's something McCain and Romney didn't do. Now, this doesn't mean that that necessarily trickles down to any individual Republican candidate. You can get a boring Republican. It's like Trump uh, endorses them, but they're just not Trump-like. 
well, then it's not going to be the same for them as if it's some maybe young, energized Republican challenging a vulnerable Democrat. And they're like, hey, folks, we're within a point and we're going to MAGA and we're going to win bigly and everything's going to be great. But you got to turn out to vote. Look, we're within a point or two. We can do it. That'll get them energized. But if it's someone who sits up there on stage and mutters as well, you know, I'm glad to have received Trump's endorsement. I think that lower taxes are a wonderful thing. I think that Bush was a stand-up guy. Yeah, that's not going to energize people. Trump's going to have to... Do you think Trump has time to go to your fucking state five or six times in a row to energize people because you can't? Yeah, he'd probably rather jettison you at that point. He doesn't want you in the Senate. He wants energetic younger Republicans, I think, disproportionately. But yeah, McCaskill getting knocked off would be great uh, for, for the Republicans. Uh, to the Democrats, I would say, as well. Bit of advice for the Democrats here because I know they, they fucking need it. Tell those vulnerable senators in Trump states to vote for the SCOTUS nominee. Now, now I don't have to worry about saying this because, you know, they're just going to assume that it's, you know, I'm playing double agent or something. No, it's honest advice, and I'll tell you why. Your party loyal already hates the leaders of the DNC. Them going against the party as a total isn't going to do, do anything wrong. If these people vote against the SCOTUS nominee, they probably lose their jobs and you lose the Senate. Long-term pain for a very, very short-term no gain at all because they're, the nominee will still go through. If they, however, vote for that nominee, it'll cause enough schismatic tendencies within the party probably to energize the far left. They'll stand, they'll vote for it, and they might face some repercussions from the younger Democrats. That's going to happen anyway, so you're not really losing anything. Look, your party is going to collapse and burn and be reformed. The paradigm shift is going to take your party under, uh, into the grave, and then it'll resurrect itself. That's just what's going to happen if, if you play your cards right. Otherwise, it dies off as a movement. Well, then tell them to fucking go ahead and vote for the SCOTUS appointee. Especially if it's Amy Barrett, because then uh, raising the specter of every Democrat voting against a female Supreme Court nominee. Not necessarily the best optics in the world for the far left voters now, is it? But you can undo that damage, at least in those competitive races. You need to take them aside and tell them to vote for this code as appointing. Which is funny, it's like the Democrats are in a meltdown over having to have this vote. You know, the, the final confirmation is only going to be a few weeks out from the midterm election. It's going to play a massive disproportionate role. It's already going to affect the race. As of tomorrow, whatever the Democrats say in response to the SCOTUS nominee is going to have massive ramifications for the campaign ahead. You know, if it is Amy Barrett, then rue unto them, because ultimately it'll be the worst of all possible situations. If it's like some a white male, you know, you're a white male, it matters less, because the Democrats can say, well, he's just stacking the court with his people. If it's a female, it becomes a little harder to make that argument now, doesn't it? That's about all. Peace out.